My name is Brad, and uh, it is really a pleasure for me to be here as well. I hope it's a pleasure for you to be here, but more importantly, it's wonderful for me. Um, I'm from Australia, and so if you hadn't worked it out already, it wasn't explicitly mentioned by Andrew, but it's a very international centre. And so Andrew is originally from New Zealand, uh, as was uh, Professor Richard Barra. Uh, um, Kang is from Singapore, I'm from Australia, uh, Camille is from from France and Chile, who's coming after me, is from mainland China. And so we are very, very diverse, very international, um, but I hope you can all understand my accent. So let me talk a bit about, about myself. Uh, so I did my PhD in Australia, and uh, my PhD supervisor was Max Liu. And if you've seen the, the brochure, he's one of the members of our advisory board, and he'll be joining us later. Um, I did postdocs in France and Australia, before I became an academic. And that was at a university in Australia called Monash University. And I just came to Imperial College last year. So I've been here for just over one year. And I can say it's very exciting uh, to be joining a centre, to be doing uh, research, not just in my own group, but with lots of other colleagues uh, in such an exciting area. I'm only gonna talk in, in a little bit of detail about one of the areas that we're working in, but I'll give you a quick snapshot about the others. So the first one is uh, we have uh, a very, well, I'm very fortunate, actually. The Department of Chemical Engineering at the moment gives great startup packages to their new hires. And so uh, I have lots of research funding uh, from the department to do research that I'm interested in, and I don't actually have to deliver on any milestones that I committed to at the front. So it's not like a research project where you said, we will deliver this material that will do that, and then you have to deliver that. At the moment, I'm very fortunate that we can just do stuff that's very cool and interesting. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today, is the cool and interesting stuff that we're doing. This is one of the cool and interesting projects. And in fact, it's so cool that I can't tell you any more about it. Uh, <laughs> because we are, and I'm very genuine about this, we're aiming to publish this in the very top journals possible. Uh, because we're trying to do something that has not been done before, and we're trying to do something that was not able to be done before, because the tools were not available. So we're developing a new tool to make direct physical measurements on materials, and especially materials that are used for membranes. Uh, so it's very, very exciting stuff. My PhD student that's working on it is, is shown there, but she's actually sitting right here, is Chen. Uh, and actually, we're going to try and advance this one with uh, one of our partner institutions, which is KAUST. And um, a representative of KAUST is here on our advisory board today. So very exciting stuff, but not the focus of my talk. I hope I didn't just get you all excited and let you down with that one. but. Uh, another project, we have two PhD students working on this one. This one's uh, partly funded by CSIRO in Australia, which is an organisation that, that funded my research before I came here. And that is to develop adsorbents and membranes to try and accomplish one of these really difficult molecular separations, which is the separations of enantiomers. So separating molecules that are chiral molecules is very difficult because their physical and thermal properties, like their vapour pressure, are, are the same, basically. And so we have to use very uh, unique methods to separate them, or we have to try and synthesize them in a way that greatly favors the, the form that we're after. And so that's a difficult separation that we're trying to tackle by developing novel materials, and especially exploiting those novel materials to try and make continuous separation using membranes. So again, I'm not gonna talk in further detail about that one today, but the two students working on it are these two here, and you're welcome to come and have a chat to them. What I am going to talk about is this one, which is, can we make a membrane that is responsive? Oh my goodness, one of the colours are missing. That is a problem. So what you have to really take my word for is that there is a membrane here. And it's, it's visible there on my screen. So imagine a membrane here. And a membrane, all of you know what membranes are, they separate things. So this membrane separates a gas stream at high pressure, which is on that side and has methane and carbon dioxide in it. And as you pass it through, some of the gas passes through. Ideally, we'd like only CO2 to go through, but sometimes some methane goes through as well. And the relative proportions of those things that go through, we call that the selectivity. So a very selective membrane would let lots of carbon dioxide through and no methane. So what we want to say is, can we make a membrane that if we shine light on it, and now the light's shining on our invisible membrane, and it has changed its performance. So this is what we call a responsive membrane. And it's responsive to an external stimulus, in this case light. 
And the idea is that we could shine the light on the membrane and change the selectivity of that membrane. So this one, well, this one is showing a higher permeability for CO2 when we put the light on it. And then if we turn the light off, its permeability drops back. So it's a reversible, responsive membrane. Likewise, you should be able to make a material that shows uh, a change in selectivity when you shine the light on it. So do, why, why are we doing this? That's, that's a really good question. Uh, the reason is that we think we can make it, and what you can't see there, again, you see a collection of particles, but it's actually embedded in a polymer membrane, uh, which is uh, now a light green colour on my screen here. But we're trying to combine a polymer and an inorganic membrane to make these light responsive membranes. So there's two ways that we could make a light responsive membrane. We could take a light responsive polymer. There are light responsive polymers available and they've been studied quite extensively, but not very much for gas separation. Most of the applications of light responsive polymers have been in the drug delivery field, okay? The other, th other way to go about it, and in, in reality we'll probably go down both paths, but the path that we're traveling down right now is to look at the filler particles. Can we fill up a polymer membrane with particles that are light responsive? And the answer is, yes we can. Okay, there was a famous black guy that said that. Yes, we can. Remember that? Eight years ago, they're just about to, to elect a new one. Uh, anyway, so yes, we can. And the reason we know that is because we've studied these materials as adsorbents. Okay, so this centre is a centre for adsorption and membranes. And the reason is they go very well together. Materials that are good sorbents have the potential to perform very well in membrane systems, either as pure selective layers in a membrane or as composite, as components in a composite system. So we've shown in a whole series of studies that we can make light responsive filler particles. And I won't go into all of the details because I think you've actually been exposed to an extraordinary amount of cutting edge research already. So I'll skim over this and just describe it, if you just focus on my hands waving here, look this way. We have particles that we can make that are metal organic framework materials and they respond when you light them up with visible light or with UV light. Actually they work better with UV light but basically they absorb CO2 and when you shine the light on them they desorb the CO2. And we've done it in a few different ways. So this first material, which is a material that uh, shows a very nice photo response. So you shine the light on, turn it off, very quick response, is a material that uses a photoresponsive linker. So Camille showed a picture of how a MOF is assembled before. It's assembled from organic linker molecules and metal ion centers. So this one uses a linker that's photoresponsive. And it has a very well-known mechanism where the light shines on it and a particular bond rotates or it flips. Changes it, not very much. It actually only changes the structure of the material in an almost imperceptibly small way, but it is enough that something like two thirds of the adsorbed CO2 will spontaneously desorb when you shine UV light on it with no change in external pressure and no change in the temperature. So it's a very strongly photoresponsive material. So we can make that material, we can make membranes, composite membranes out of it. That's the first one that we did. We actually showed that there are different ways that you can induce this photoresponsive behavior into filler particles for membranes. So this is a different one where we didn't make the structure of the material photoresponsive. We took a material that was almost not photoresponsive, but we loaded uh, a guest molecule, a dye molecule inside it, where the dye molecule was photoresponsive. And so this is a different way to induce photoresponsive gas sorption behavior in an adsorbent material. And so in this material, the dye molecule is a complex molecule that can exist in different photoisomers, but when you illuminate it with visible light or UV light, it changes its structure quite significantly and it forces some of the adsorbed CO2 to be desorbed from the material. And so I've talked about two different ways of inducing a photoresponsive material. The third one that we showed, and this was all done by a former PhD student of mine who now works with one of our partners from Georgia Tech, who's, who, her new advisor is sitting here, flow in from the US today for our for our opening, so wonderful to have another American visitor here. This is a material that was different to the other two. This one, instead of you shining the light on and it desorbs the CO2, this is a material where we coated it with a photoresponsive molecule, so the, 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 the dye that we added didn't go in and locate itself in the pores, but it was mostly on the surface. And this material, when you shine the light onto it, it becomes able to absorb significant quantities of CO2. So this is a light-activated CO2 sorbent. So 
the whole point of the story is that we've developed this suite of materials as adsorbents that display these really innovative, really exciting properties. The first two are ones that are light responsive, so you load CO2 into the material, you illuminate them with light and they desorb some portion of the CO2. The third one is the opposite, that until you light it up, it can't absorb much CO2. So we've done the first part, we've made the light responsive materials. The next part is, okay, these work very well as adsorbents, at least in very small scales on batch type experiments, can we make them into membranes? So, and I'm gonna skip over the challenges because that's what all good researchers do and move straight on to the exciting bit. Uh, so this is, this is really exciting. This is how, if you did make a photoresponsive membrane, how would you measure that it actually works? So you can't, at the moment, just go to a, a chemical equipment supplier and buy a membrane test cell where you can illuminate your membrane. So being engineers, we're a team of engineers and scientists, we just made our own. So if you, now you can see the membrane actually in the middle of this cell here. If you wanted to put a membrane in a typical test cell and illuminate it to make photoresponsive measurements, you would have to make the test cell transparent. That's very challenging. Partly because you want to pressurise the cell and partly because even if something looks optically transparent, so when you look at something that appears to you to be transparent, it's usually not transparent to UV. Usually it absorbs a significant fraction of UV light. So what, all we did is said, well, instead of putting the UV source on the outside of our membrane test cell, let's just make the test cell slightly bigger and put it on the inside. And what makes this possible is the fact that now, if you go to the bathrooms downstairs, you'll notice that the ceiling is all fitted out with highly efficient LED lighting, okay? So we don't need old incandescent lights anymore. We can use highly efficient, very small, and by very efficient, I mean they convert a large proportion of the electricity into light. So we can actually take a tiny light source now. To do UV experiments, we used to need big UV lamps, like xenon lamps, or very expensive, very high-powered lamps. Now we can take a tiny, high-performance LED. It costs about 100 times more than the LEDs that go in your lights that you use at home, but it's still really quite affordable, and it fits on a chip. Okay, the actual LED, the, the diode itself that emits the light is two millimetres by two millimetres. So we can put it inside a test cell, put some power leads through it, that's what the LED looks like, and that's what the cell looks like. So now we can, and this was running in the lab, I don't know if it's running today, but it was running last week. We can make membranes, we can seal them in, they're the same dimensions that people usually use for, for testing these small flat sheet membranes, they're 50 millimetre diameter. In fact, the base of the cell matches up with ones that are made by commercial manufacturers. And we can put our photoresponsive membranes in and we can test them. So we connected up to a power supply. That's Nikolaus, the student who, who helped invent these and actually did all of the work to get them built, tested and assembled, and he's running them right now. So that's, that's what it looks like with the light turned on. So the lab was in, com in complete darkness when I turned this on. Um, took a quick photo because really you shouldn't have the, the UV light just exposed like that. That's what the warning sticker on the side says. And the, on the left is one of the photoresponsive materials that we're working with now. So uh, to wrap up my talk, I, I, I didn't put much more detail in, so probably I finished early, which is good because Chile has a lot of slides. Uh, <laughs> but the question is, uh, if you would like to have one of these, we can sell you one. So you can't go and have one of these right now. You can't buy it off the shelf. Uh, you could try and make one yourself, but then you would have to go through all the iterations that we went through and all the, all the same mistakes before you get to the final product. So because Imperial is great at commercialising stuff, uh, we have used their, uh, their system called QuickTech, uh, which is like a catalogue business run by Imperial Innovations. So if you have a small discovery uh, that's easily sold and especially easily manufactured here in, in, our, uh, in our facilities, then, then you can buy it. So we haven't quite got the final approval. There's some issues around the fact that it's a pressurised vessel, but it's just about to be for sale and uh, they won't be expensive either. So we're not trying to make a lot of money. Uh, we're trying to get lots of people to buy them and do this type of research and grow the field, basically. So in a snapshot, that's the work that, that we do in our little part of the Barra Centre. Um, it's all focused around advanced materials and especially membranes. And this particular aspect of what I've talked about today is responsive, photoresponsive materials. 
If you think about it, there's no urgent need to use light as the external stimulus to make the materials photoresponsive, uh, to make the materials re responsive. There are already examples in the literature where people have used other external energy inputs. You can use microwave, for example, and there's probably good opportunities to use ultrasound as well. Um, so I think it's a, a really exciting field to be working in. It's definitely right at the edge. Uh, there's, there's no industrial applications of this kind of thing at the moment, but uh, I hope in the future there is. So thanks for listening to my talk. I have had fun, and uh, I'll answer all of your questions when you come and ask me later today. <laughs>